right, I would like to welcome everybody to our uh, seminar tonight on woodland management. We originally had planned to have this as in person instruction. And uh, unfortunately, we ran into a situation. <laughs> so we have transitioned this to a um, webinar, which is certainly not best, but maybe it's second best. So a um, few initial instructions here. I'd, uh, just glad you were all here and hopefully the process of signing up for this course and and also signing in tonight was not too cumbersome for you. Um, we've got everybody muted. Uh, we've had a lot of experience with these programs that, uh, gosh, if we don't have everybody muted, we have a, a lot of background sound and it's just not good. So if you have a question, um, encourage you to find um, a little bubble that kind of looks like one of those cartoon bubbles where somebody's talking down at the bottom. Just hover your mouse around the bottom of your screen and that should pop up. That should bring up the chat pod off to the right. And if you have questions, uh, I will try to keep a, an eye on that chat pod and Lenny and I both will try to keep, um, keep our eye out on that and answer all your questions. Um, there is an evaluation at the end. As you close out this program, it should kick you to an evaluation. And it's it's very short. It'll only take two or three minutes, but Lenny and I would both greatly appreciate your feedback. So please uh, keep that in mind toward the end. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lenny Farley. He's our uh, Purdue Extension Forester. And uh, a lot of topics to uh, talk about tonight. And without further ado, Lenny, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to be with you folks tonight. And uh, we're going to get started on the program, uh, mostly so we can get through this and also so you have time for questions and we can handle those questions. So I'm going to start sharing my screen now with the presentation. I'll get everything loaded up and ready to go. And hopefully this will all work as it should. It is looking good. All right, very good. I'm going to close out my images here. There we go. Okay, so what we're going to emphasize tonight is the broad topic of managing for a healthy woodland. And more in specifics, we're going to look at invasive species, uh, a practice called timber stand improvement, and then where you can go for advice and assistance and help with your management on your own property. And I wanted to talk a little bit about forest management to start with. And so there's a variety of kind of pictures that can come to mind when it comes to forest management. Uh, but really forest management is about defining our goals and objectives for a property and then coming to a plan where we develop a list of activities over a period of time to help us meet those goals and objectives. So we're thinking about the organization and coordination of activities in order to achieve defined objectives. And so you as the landowner are developing that list of objectives based on some questions I'm gonna bring up here in just a little bit. The other thing that helps define the objectives is the land that you have. And so what are the resources on it? What are the conditions of those resources? Uh, what's the capacity of the land in terms of soil and water uh, to actually achieve those objectives? And so we've got to bring those things together, what the capacity and the condition of your land is and what your objectives are for your property over the long term. We then translate that through management planning and activities that we're going to help meet your objectives. And then we follow that with an evaluation process that feeds back into informing what kind of adaptive management and changes do we need to make to get further down the road? Because one of the things we know is these systems are complex and we don't always get the exact results we think we're gonna get because every situation is a little different. So this process actually works very well though and almost any professional that's gonna work with you is gonna be working through something like this to help you get to where you wanna go on your property. So when we start thinking about defining our objectives, I've got some questions that I always like to work with on landowners to help you think about what my objectives are and what do I hope to accomplish. And so oftentimes start with why do I own this land? So 
what is the purpose of my ownership? Have I thought about what I enjoy about this property? What do I like to do? What do I like about it? And then also, what do I expect from it right now? So what kind of things do I want or need off this property, whether that be income or recreational opportunities, uh, a, a family getaway? And then what do I expect in the future? And so do I have uh, some additional expectations and maybe different expectations down the road as I develop my objectives and work toward those management practices? Uh, and these objectives can go across the scale in terms of what we might be interested in doing on a woodland from wildlife to timber production to recreational pursuits and everything in between. And the other thing we want to talk about is why we actually manage forests. And so there can be kind of a, a common perception out there that will forests are natural systems. And so why would I have to do anything to them? Uh, they're just going to operate fine on their own. But in fact, uh, that's not necessarily the case anymore. And so through our history of use and in many cases abuse of forest lands, we've actually disrupted the natural processes that happen and that can create issues in terms of a natural balance between uh, things like white-tailed deer and tree regeneration or invasive species competing with our native species. And so oftentimes in those situations, uh, some kind of management is needed. Also with management, if we've got objectives for certain types of products or benefits, we can actually work effectively with management to help us enhance the productivity and health of our property and to achieve particular benefits and products that we want to see happen on the property. And so management helps us address past issues of disturbance and misuse, and it helps us push toward a more healthy and productive forest that better meets the specific benefits and products that we have interest in. The other thing that's really important, particularly for wildlife and also uh, uh, general biological diversity, is maintaining a diversity of ages and types of forest across the landscape landscape and so what i mean by that is that we're looking at the broad sweep of species composition and also different ages and types of structures of forest across the landscape uh, this becomes very important when we start looking at the different needs of different wildlife species in terms of different types of trees different sizes and densities of trees and having that mix across the landscape that keeps them in place. And so oftentimes we can kind of break it down into these three words. We're doing a restoration work to take care of some of the past problems we've had on properties. We're doing conservation work to maintain those benefits through the long time. And then we're actually, actually doing some cultivation work to encourage certain benefits that we're really strongly interested in. And so that's really what's behind this idea of forest management. And we do this because of, in many cases, that past history of some uh, rough use. So in many cases, uh, if you look at your woodlands, uh, I know particularly in northern Indiana, it's very true in many places in southern Indiana too, we'll find old fence line on the edge of the woods. And that typically was a sign that there was historically grazing in that woods, whether it be hogs or cattle or any other types of livestock. And unmanaged grazing can be very damaging to woodland trees and woodland regeneration. We've also had a history on our properties in many cases of what we call high grade harvesting, where only the, the highest quality, highest value trees have been harvested and everything else was left behind. And that oftentimes results in poor species composition or a lot of damaged and poor quality trees left and not much in the way of really high value or, or beneficial trees for the future. More recently, we've started fighting with invasive species invading our woodlands, a variety of non-native trees, shrubs, forbs, and grasses that compete strongly with our native species. Uh, in many cases, due to a past history of uh, heavy cutting or grazing and more open conditions, we can have really high numbers of grapevines. Uh, grapevines are native, but at really high numbers, they can be very damaging to trees that we may want to grow. In so many cases, reducing those numbers of grapevines is a good practice. And then also, we can uh, help nature with thinning with active management. And so in many cases, a lot of our woodlands are uh, what we would call overstocked. Uh, have lots and lots of trees per acre that are competing with each other very strongly 
the end result is all of those trees have slow growth. And if we get a drought or some other significant event that stresses those trees, we can have a fair amount of uh, mortality or subject to insect attack more so than would be normal. So all of these present opportunities for us to manage to address past and, cur and current problems we may find in woodlands. Uh, Lenny, if I could cut in here on the, that last slide there, could you go back? Will do. Uh, on that, the picture to the left, so that that's what you're talking about as far as uh, overly stocked forest. Uh, what would be the preferred culling technique uh, uh, for, a, I assume we don't cut them all down, we might girdle them, but what, what would you use to cull the uh, trees that need to come out? Yeah, that's a great question. So that is a walnut plantation that was never, ever thinned. Uh, and this is pretty typical of walnut. Uh, those trees will continue to grow together for 25, 30 or more years. And the crowns just keep getting smaller and smaller. And they're actually sprouting along the stems because they're so stressed out. They've got so little crown to actually feed the tree. Uh, what we would typically do in a, a situation like that is in many cases, girdle those trees. And so we'll take a chainsaw, or run a couple of rings around those trees about an inch deep to separate that band of vascular tissue and essentially starve the tree. Uh, usually if you do a couple of cuts with walnut, you don't even have to use herbicides. And in a solid species planting like that, I oftentimes sh shy away from spraying herbicides in there. You could also fell those trees, but uh, uh, in many cases, it's just as easy to girdle them and leave them standing. And we do tend to do less damage to standing residual trees that way. Good question. So another event uh, that many of you are familiar with now is the advent of emerald ash borer and the death of ash in many of your properties. And oftentimes what that does is leave some holes behind. Uh, and in many cases, unfortunately, invasive species will fill those holes. Or in some other cases, trees that are maybe less desirable for a wildlife habitat or timber production uh, or other objectives you may have may fill those holes in. And so that insect attack that created space in the woods in some cases uh, pushes us to a point where we need to be thinking about some management to improve the overall composition and quality of our property through time rather than just letting whatever happens happen and, and accept that as a long-term outcome for our property. So when we look at woodland management, it's primarily about managing space and light. And so we're going to do that for the trees that we want to see grow uh, through several different techniques. One of the first things we look at in managing woodland is we want to control undesirable plants. And oftentimes, in particular, this is invasive species. And we'll talk uh, at some length about those in just a little bit. Uh, so that's oftentimes job number one, because what we find is if we don't control those invasive species, they will start spreading seed. And if we create some additional sunlight in there through thinning, they respond very positively to that. And so they can produce a lot more seed, grow much faster. And so getting those taken care of quickly is oftentimes the most important thing we can do. It allows us to have an opportunity to do all the other work without having bad impacts from the invasives. In many cases, we're looking at thinning trees where the density is too high to continue to grow those trees well. Uh, and in some cases, what we're able to do, if, if we've got uh, marketable trees that are big enough to put into timber markets, we can harvest trees. And that will also help us manage the space and light around trees that we would like to continue to grow and capture the value in those harvested trees to boot. And one of the other things we're looking at is actually creating openings where we have more sunlight coming into the forest. And that allows us to regenerate a different group of trees that need full sunlight to grow. And in some other places, we're going to manage the amount of can canopy density to favor trees that need partial sunlight to regenerate and grow well. And so by managing that amount of space and light, we can help enhance growth of trees we want to grow and also favor the regeneration of certain types of trees that need those particular levels of sunlight to regenerate. This is also a way where we can manage different habitat types for different species of wildlife, whether it be a species that likes a more high and open forest canopy or something that really likes some brushy ground where we're going to provide a lot of light in the understory of the forest and let a lot of shrubs and plants grow there that produce the habitat that particular species is looking for. 
And this is all based on an ecological principle called forest succession. And it's the progression of one plant community after another based on the characteristics of those plant communities. And so if we were to look at an abandoned ag field, for example, forest succession would progress from annual weeds and grasses that would invade that area on to more perennial uh, plants and shrubs. But ultimately, as trees start to invade, they have an advantage because they can grow taller and start shading out that other material. And so unless those plants have shade tolerance and can live in the understory, they ultimately are outcompeted by the trees. But some trees need full sunlight to regenerate, while other species, like oaks, need partial sunlight. And some species, like beech and sugar maple, can regenerate in their own shade or the shade of other trees. And so depending on how much disturbance, thinning, harvesting, or natural disturbances like fire or wind enter a forest, that determines what species is going to be predominant there. The less disturbance we typically have, the more it pushes toward that's called a climax forest of the species that can regenerate in their own shade. If we have a little more disturbance, we tend to favor some of those earlier successional species that need more sunlight. And so this disturbance now serves as a tool to help us manage the biological diversity over that landscape by protecting some areas from disturbance and adding disturbance into the system and others to get that diversity of species on the ground. And so here's the, the kind of three basic groups that we oftentimes look at in terms of trees, although there's a lot of variation between species and their strategies to, to survive in the forest environment. Uh, the first one is the shade intolerant trees. And these trees are the type that will come in in an ag field uh, after a, a type of clear cut timber harvest or a major fire that clears out the overstory. There's hardly any shade on site. Oftentimes there's a fair amount of open soil area that's exposed. And so seeds land in, oftentimes either wind blown or wildlife carried. And so we have things like aspen, tulip tree, uh, sweet gum, black cherry. These are all species that will come in, grow very quickly, occupy that site in, in quick order and start casting shade on that site and become the dominant vegetation because of that rapid height growth. But because they are not tolerant of shade, they cannot regenerate in their own shade. And so without additional disturbance, they have essentially hit a dead end. So they'll run their lifetime and spread their seed, hoping that seed can move to an area where there is disturbance. Uh, so that's their strategy for survival. An intermediate group in terms of shade tolerance includes things like oaks and hickories. And these species will typically do best in regenerating in a system where there's partial shade. And historically, this was oftentimes created by fires. And so uh, the, the First Nations people, Native Americans, used fire extensively on the landscape as a management tool. And many of our old growth forests have a significant amount of oak and hickory in them. And that's oftentimes evidence of that management practice that the Native Americans used historically. Uh, we don't have that as much on the landscape now. And so in fact, what we're seeing is not as much oak regeneration as we historically have seen because our pioneer forefathers also were using uh, those same tools on the landscape in many, in many places to manage or clear land and actually encourage the regeneration of oak either accidentally or on purpose. Uh, so we're starting to reintroduce fire in some places as a management tool for favoring the regeneration of oaks. It's important to note, though, that fire is not a tool you want to use unless you've had significant training and experience and a pretty good crew with you. And so we encourage you, if you're thinking about applying fire on your property, talk to a, a forester. Uh, get some advice and assistance. There are several that will do uh, contract burning here in Indiana, but it's not not a tool you want to use on your own because it uh, it can be a difficult one to manage, and mistakes are uh, are definitely a big problem in that area. Uh, there are several groups though that are using fire to good effect to regenerate oak, and so this is a nature conservancy property in southern Indiana, and they have used a combination of what we call uh, uh, shelterwood cutting where we cut trees in the understory 
of a forest area to provide diffuse sunlight to come down. And this really favors the growth of the oaks and hickories. And then they're also reintroducing fire into these systems. And fire helps kind of tip the balance toward the oak and hickory and against things like beech and maple because the oak and hickory will tolerate fire. They will re-sprout from the root systems where oftentimes beech and maple don't do nearly as well in a fire environment. So that combination of understory thinning and introduction of fire is a great way in many cases to get oak back on the landscape. In some cases, we can do this successfully with just the understory thinning. Uh, and that's something you can certainly work with a forester on to help you think about if you're looking at it, regenerating oak on your property, what are some of the practices I can use to do that? And then the last group is the, uh, the shade tolerant trees. And this is a group of trees that are really starting to dominate a lot of the regeneration of our forests. Uh, and it's because we don't have as much disturbance history in our forest now as we've had in the past. Uh, we don't have a lot of grazing in the woods. We don't have a lot of burning. Um, we do have occasional harvests. Oftentimes, though, they're relatively light harvests. They don't put a lot of light on the ground in the forest. And so it really favors these species. Things like sugar maple, beech, ironwood, and hornbeam all are shade tolerant and are going to be able to regenerate in the shade of their own species or others and kind of do that ad infinitum until some major disturbance puts a lot of sunlight into the forest canopy, uh, underneath the forest canopy. And for those folks interested in wildlife management and encouraging a diversity of species in their wildlife, this management to create different ages and structures of your forest can be a really valuable tool. And so what we see here is the different structures and ages of forests on the bottom and lines indicating the different habitats that several of these species will utilize. And so we've got some species we would call generalists that'll uh, utilize almost any of these habitats, uh, things like short-tailed shrew, uh, white-tailed white, white deer, uh, white-footed mice. A lot of these species really are ha happy with almost anything they can find and do well in almost any age forest. There are others, though, that are very particular about needing certain types of forest to do well. And one that's just about four down here is the rough grouse. Rough grouse are typically looking for forest areas for at least parts of their life cycle that are somewhere between 10 and 30 years old. And in fact, we've got uh, a relatively little amount of that on the landscape now. And so rough grouse have gone from a relatively populous bird when I was in high school to a bird that's probably gonna be on our endangered species list very shortly in Indiana. And that's mostly because we don't have the level of forest disturbance historically we've had, and so we don't have as much young forest. So it's important to have our full diversity of landscape features and forest ages and structures to have that full diversity of wildlife species on the landscape. And we can actually accomplish that uh, through management that provides a more healthy forest for all these different wildlife species. So I mentioned we were going to get to invasive species, and this is one of the great uh, threats to the potential for our forest to be healthy over the long term and to provide quality wildlife habitat and regeneration of our native hardwood trees, shrubs, and plants. So this is a forest that has been overtaken in the understory by Asian bush honeysuckle. And you can imagine uh, the difficulty any plant, shrub, or tree would have trying to regenerate in that solid understory, casting shade on the forest floor. Uh, you can pretty much imagine there's hardly anything underneath that layer. And it gets greener quicker in the spring and stays greener longer in the fall than pretty much any of our native plants as well. And so with the, without any management to address this invasion, what we're gonna end up with is a forest dominated by this plant and pretty much excluding regeneration of native species through time and really a degrading situation over time because of that invasive plant. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a lot of different species here. Uh, Indiana just recently enacted a rule uh, outlawing the sale, trade, barter, or movement of over 40 different invasive plants. Uh, so I've not come anywhere close to covering the span. These are some of the primary offenders that we deal with on the landscape, but there are many more that are causing problems. You'll notice several of these are landscape plants. Some of these have been planted historically for wildlife habitat purposes. 
all of them have escaped into forest areas and because of aggressive growth, uh, producing a lot of seed and significant shade tolerance are out competing our native plants across the landscape. So lesson number one, don't plant non-native invasives. Uh, lesson number two, we're going to have to attack this problem because they have natural advantages over our natives. And so just sitting idly by and hoping the situation gets better will not work in these cases. It's pretty clear that with, if we don't take active management against these plants, they become more dominant as opposed to less dominant on the landscape through time. And I've got a couple of examples here of plants we'll, we'll take a closer look at. It would take another two hours to go through all the invasive plants in terms of ID and control, so we won't have time for that tonight, but we've got a lot of good resources coming on that. So you saw the uh, potential for Asian bush honeysuckle. Uh, this one has been planted for many years, uh, oftentimes historically for wildlife and sometimes for uh, landscaping purposes. Uh, opposite leaf arrangement, uh, red berries in the fall. It's uh, eaten by birds, but it's not really a great food value. It's kind of a sugary snack rather than a good high quality food for them. Many of our natives like uh, uh, the viburnums and dogwoods provide much better food value in terms of berry production. There's about three different species that we can find on the landscape. And so that lower right hand photo shows some of the different color and texture, but all of them have this opposite leaf arrangement and also, if you slice or break open the twigs, you're going to find a hollow center or pith uh, with a little brown coating in there. Uh, some of our native species like dogwoods and viburnums with opposite leaf arrangement uh, can look a little bit like this, but they have a, a solid pith on the inside. So good way to tell them apart. Another one that's emerged on the landscape and is becoming a huge problem very quickly is uh, calorie pear. This has been used extensively for landscaping under a variety of different names. The original one was Bradford pear, but there were several other varieties developed. Uh, the original Bradford pear was a, a sterile plant. It would not self-pollinate, but when they develop new var varieties of this, they do cross with Bradford and with them each other and produce fertile fruit. And the birds have scattered that fertile fruit around the landscape. And many of you probably noticed this spring along uh, right of ways along roads or waste areas. Uh, you'll find these spires of white blooms are actually starting to fade here in Indiana or in this part of Indiana, one of the first ones to bloom. Uh, most of that is calorie pear. Uh, it gets to be tree size and it's uh, it's going to be a very difficult one to deal with because of the uh, amount of fruit production and the spread by birds. But if we don't manage it, we will literally lose acre upon acre to this as the dominant plant in place of our natives. And it was planted because it is a beautiful plant. Uh, gorgeous spring blooms, nice fall color, but the cost to the uh, ecosystem and our native species is definitely not worth it. And we've got some really nice natives like uh, uh, flowering dogwood and uh, juneberry that are great substitutes of this plant. So how do we tackle some of these problems? Uh, we talked about controlling undesirable plants. Well, there's a variety of different ways we're going to go through here. Uh, you can start with some mechanical techniques. And so uh, if you've got some equipment or want to rent or hire out some equipment, there's several attachments to the skid steer type loaders uh, that are quite maneuverable and can work in forest areas pretty effectively. Uh, uh, on the upper right hand side here, we've got a grasper. And so you can pull out the plant with a whole root system. And that's a pretty good control technique. It does disturb the soil quite a bit, but some folks prefer that approach and it can work pretty well. On the upper right, we have a, a grinder head. Uh, so this rotates and essentially chews up that vegetation down to, or even maybe a little below ground line. Now, in many cases, those root systems will re-sprout, but we've greatly reduced the biomass, turned it into mulch. We can come back in and do a foliar herbicide spray the following season and very efficiently control a lot of invasives. I have a picture on the lower right here of the uh, saw head on a brush saw that I own. This is essentially a souped up weed eater. It's a great way to cut vines and shrubs. And then we can either squirt the stump with an herbicide or spray an herbicide on the re-sprouts to control that plant. Uh, if you want to avoid the use of herbicides, uh, pulling out root systems is a good way to do that. If you can get the root system up and out of the ground and dry it out, kill that plant, you've controlled it. And there's a variety of different levers and other tools we can use 
for uh, pulling plants if they're a little too big to pull just with your hands. And I almost always carry with me, if I'm working in the woods, a little folding razor saw and a hatchet or a machete. And I find they're both very handy for dealing with uh, both grape grapevines, uh, other invasive vines and invasive shrubs. But oftentimes what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna control uh, these using a, a combination of approaches. And so one of the most effective uh, for many different species is to cut off that plant and then treat the stump of that plant with an herbicide. And so we call this cut surface herbicide application. Uh, pick your tool you want to use to cut the stem off and then apply an herbicide. And we'll talk about several good choices to use. One of the important things to consider in this approach, though, is that when you cut that stem, you do need to apply the herbicide, particularly if it's a water based herbicide, very quickly after cutting, usually within 15 minutes or so. If you wait around, number one, you may not find that cut stump again. That's one of the problems I have. And number two, it can start sealing very much like the bottom of a Christmas tree and not take up that herbicide. And therefore, you're not going to get con good control of the root system and it's going to resprout. Uh, so cutting and treating that cut stump is a great way to do control over many different species. If you uh, really don't want to do cutting or don't want to have a lot of brush on the ground, there is another approach that's possible. Uh, this is called basal bark treatment. And here we take a material that's based on the triclopyr ester herbicide. So Garlon or triclopyr 4 are two common trade names. And we mix that at about 20% herbicide with about 80% carrier oil. And that oil could be a commercially available basal oil, which is what we typically recommend. But on the labels of these herbicides, normally it also will list diesel oil, kerosene, or fuel oil. And we spray that on the bottom 18 inches or so of the stem of the plant that we want to control. And the oil helps the herbicide penetrate into the plant and kill the plant with that, with that chemical. It's a, a relatively expensive treatment in my mind because you're buying both the carrier in terms of the oil and the herbicide. And you've got to apply a fair amount, particularly to larger stems, to get good control. And it takes a fair amount of time in my book to uh, apply that to the stems uh, in an efficient pattern. But if you want to avoid cutting, this is certainly a good option. And we oftentimes will recommend this for controlling tree of heaven because it does help reduce the amount of root sprouting we get on that particular plant. It may be a little less effective as the diameter of the uh, plant you're trying to control goes up. So above six inches uh, diameter chest height, it, uh, it may be a less, little less effective, also less effective on big, thick, corky bark. So you may need to treat a little bit more of the stem in terms of length to get good control in some cases. The other thing we found is we have to be careful when it's particularly warm outside, 85 degrees plus. What we found is that this herbicide uh, oil mix can volatilize in high temperatures and actually float off of the target plant and create a herbicide haze in the understory, uh, killing or damaging plants that you didn't intend to. Plus, you're losing the herbicide that was originally applied to that target plant. So here's a little close up of the application. This is uh, really one of the ideal targets is smooth bark trees or shrubs. And this I believe is autumn olive. Excellent control technique for those. The other technique we can look at is as we mentioned, foliar applications on either sprouts from uh, stems that we have cut off, allowed them to re-sprout. And when we'll put a foliar application of an herbicide on those sprouts or on smaller plants. Uh, you can do foliar applications on larger plants, but oftentimes it's difficult to get good coverage. And with woody plants, it's important to get good complete coverage on the leaf area to get good control. And we're also having an increased potential for drift, uh, moving another herbicide off of where you're wanting to apply onto other places where you don't want it. Uh, so we're typically recommending that you use it on smaller plants, but it's especially good for really heavy infestations or following up with uh, perhaps a cutting or grinding where you're going to have a lot of root sprouts come up that are small in stature and pretty easy to get to. So timber stand improvement 
it, it really is kind of wrapping in some of the invasive species control, but it's an, uh, a practice that's been around a long time. And in fact, in many cases, now we're calling it forest stand improvement because it's not just for encouraging timber production. We can actually use it for a variety of different uh, techniques. So what we're doing with timber stand improvement is we're deadening some trees to provide growing space for more desirable trees, trees that are going to do a better job of meeting our management objectives. We're going to cut some vines that may be competing with some of those desirable trees. Now, in some cases, I'll leave some vines in some places for wildlife habitat benefits. But if I've got a vine that's strongly competing with a tree that I really want to see grow, we'll typically cut those. We're going to thin some areas of mostly desirable trees where we need more space to continue to get good vigorous growth on the very best trees in that spot. And sometimes this is the hardest work to do. We've got a bunch of good trees. And we'd like to grow them all, <coughs> pardon me, but as those trees get bigger, they need more space. And so as they start competing strongly with each other for space, they're stressing each other out, slowing the growth of all the trees down and making themselves more susceptible to potential damage or disease issues. And so that thinning helps us select what the winning trees are and maintain a good vigorous growth rate and condition through time. Lenny, we had a question. Yes. Um, is control by animals like goats or pigs another option for controlling some of these invasive species. I know that's been pretty effective with multiflora rose, but could you address that particular question? Yes, that's a, that's a topic I didn't bring up, but it is an option. And so we just have to be careful about the application. So uh, uh, Ron Rathfon, our extension forester at Southern Indiana Purdue Ag Center has used goats to, just as John said, control multiflora rose, but you know, they control almost everything else there too. <laughs> uh, so they're not very selective and uh, hogs also are not very selective, but they're also rooting. And so we can have significant soil damage issue with, with hogs. So you need to be judicious and careful about your application of that. I, and most of the outfits I've seen that have been successful with this have used primarily either sheep or goats as a technique to browse down undesirable plants to get the size down and the density down. And then they would come in with, uh, with foliar applications of herbicide to kill the re-sprouts because most of these are not taking root systems out. They're just taking the tops down. But it is a tool uh, kind of in the, the mechanical control uh, category that could be used in conjunction with herbicides. So great question. And the other thing we're doing with timber stand improvement is when we have either a storm event that creates an opening or maybe a harvest event that creates an opening, we will come in, drop trees that were not taken down to produce a full sunlight environment. We essentially call it completing the openings. And that allows us to regenerate those light loving trees that are only going to come back in those situations where we provide that full sunlight environment. So several different approaches and management techniques we can use as part of timber stand improvement. So the first one is the vines. Uh, as I mentioned, grapevines are native here in Indiana, several different species. They can be an important part of wildlife habitat benefits, both in terms of food and cover value. And some birds even use the bark for nesting, uh, but they can also be incredibly damaging to many trees. And in many woodlands, they're at higher population levels than they historically would have been because of past disturbance like grazing or heavy cutting. And so targeting our control of grapevines uh, to take them the competition away from some of our higher quality trees can be really beneficial. Grapevines have a tendency to grow up with trees and cover over the canopies with their large leaf area. And they can either slow down the growth or actually kill the trees. And in many cases also will do mechanical damage either through distorting the growth or actual additional weight during an ice or or a heavy snowstorm that can pull branches out. So it's a really good practice to control grapevines and trees that you really wanna see grow and do well. Uh, in outside edge areas on the edge of woodlands or along stream corridors, a lot of times I'll keep some grapevines for that wildlife habitat benefit. And you may find some patches in your woods where you've got a huge bower of grapevines that's pretty much dominated everything. And sometimes it's better just to walk away from that as well and call that a wildlife habitat area because it can be a lot of work uh, to try to actually get that under control. 
Uh, if you want to kill grapevines, oftentimes we will cut them off a little bit above ground and spray an herbicide on the cut stump. Oftentimes we're using Tordon or Pathway or one of the Garlon products. Uh, you can also use high percent glyphosate in some cases other than in the spring. So I just cut a vine just about two or three days ago. And right now the water is literally just pouring out of those vines. And so you can imagine what's going to happen to herbicide if you spray that on that cut end. It's just going to get washed right out. So if you really want to do grapevine control in the spring, uh, you can use the basal bark application technique that we talked about earlier. So about 20% triclopyr ester herbicide, about 80% oil. Spray that on the bottom 18 inches or so of the grapevine and you get pretty good control. Uh, the other option is just simply wait and not do it during the spring. And the other thing we've got an option with the grapevines is if you've got good heavy shade and that shade is going to stay in that area, you're not going to do thinning or harvesting for another two to three years. In many cases, you don't have to use herbicide. You can cut that vine, and it oftentimes will re-sprout and try to grow, but first thing, they don't like shade very much, don't do well in shade, and secondly, deer really like to browse the new sprouts as well. Now, if you've got a low stature, young forest, uh, quite a bit of sunlight coming in another story, that's not going to work because that strong root system is going to send those grapevines right back up the trees that you just cut them out of. So. Uh, much sunlight in the stand, use some herbicide. If you got a lot of shade, you may be able to get by without it. One of our other practices in timber stand improvement is in high density areas, thinning out to provide additional growing space to favor the trees we want to grow over time. Uh, Mother Nature will naturally thin forests, but it takes longer and she may not pick the winners that you would have picked based on your objectives. And so we ex exercise a little bit of timing and control on future composition by making those the thinning decisions a little earlier. That allows us to maintain the vigor of those trees and select who the winners are going to be through time. And so the first picture was a really dense tulip tree stand. Uh, this is an oak and hickory stand that's been thinned to provide additional growing space for those nice young oak and hickory to continue to grow well. And that means sacrificing some trees that actually look pretty good. But we've got to recognize as those trees get bigger, that's a bigger and bigger crown to feed the growth of that tree. They have to have more space. We also may have particular trees on our property that are doing a really good job of meeting some of our management objectives. And we want to maintain their growth through time. And so this is actually my property and I've got a mixed management objective of wildlife habitat, biological diversity, but also timber income through time. And so on the left hand side of the screen is a three stemmed honey locust, which has very little timber value. And on the right hand side is a pretty nice little black walnut tree that's got pretty good timber value and good potential to grow on this site. And so I girdled uh, using a chainsaw and applied herbicide in those girdles, those three uh, honey locust stems because they were crowding the canopy, the top of my black walnut, reducing its capacity to continue to grow. And so I made a selection based on my management objectives of what tree I wanted to favor versus what tree needed to be controlled to favor the growth of that tree that's achieving my objectives through time. And several different techniques we can use for girdling. Uh, the one that's probably the simplest and most effective typically is a single uh, cut into the stem, usually going about an inch in all the way through the bark, through the cambium that's right inside the bark that generates the new cells and into the, the uh, sapwood, and then spraying herbicide into that cut to then kill the tissue there so it doesn't gap over that cut. Uh, if we don't spray that herbicide in there, oftentimes that cambium can actually jump that cut put new tissue together and that tree will live. If you don't want to use herbicide, there is the potential to do double girdling. And so we do that same cut twice around the tree, usually four to six inches apart. Uh, but there are some trees that that's not going to be particularly effective on controlling. Seems like some of them are able to have a little bit of conducting tissue inside those cuts and kind of get past that girdle. So oftentimes our girdle with herbicide is our most effective approach. If you don't want to use a chainsaw, and some days I don't, I decide I don't want to put the safety gear on, I don't want to pack the gas in, I'm going to do a little bit of work as I go, I take a hatchet with me. And if we are using herbicide, we can do this uh, frill method on the left-hand side where we cut 
about 30 to 45 degree angles into the stem all the way around through the bark and cambium into the sapwood to create little pockets. And we'll squirt our herbicide into those pockets uh, to kill that band and control that tree, also controls root sprouting. If we don't want to use herbicide, it's important to hack out uh, a three inch or more band all the way around the tree where we've taken off the bark cambium and some of the sapwood so that it can't conduct water and food up and down in the tree. And this can be pretty effective as well, although I do occasionally find trees that for whatever reason it didn't work on, probably some vascular tissue buried a little deeper in the stem and it, it didn't control that tree. So once again, normally herbicides a little more effective. Uh, we see the herbicides here we can use Tordon RTU, Pathway is another one, uh, Garlon 3A. This is the amine formulation of triclopyr. One uh, warning on any kind of, of a girdling technique is that if you don't get a good girdle all the way around the tree and through the bark cambium and into the sapwood, you're probably not going to control that tree. It's amazing what they can recover from. Uh, the uh, So we've got a situation here where they didn't meet up the cuts and that tree lived. In my career, I've actually marked a few trees for harvest that had been girdled probably 20 years earlier uh, that did, the girdle didn't take. Uh, and so make sure your cuts meet. The other thing to watch out for is if there's injury points or hollows in the tree, that bark uh, and cambium and sapwood will curl around and you oftentimes have to plunge your saw in to get those separated uh, to actually control that tree. So complete coverage all the way around to get the best control and then a good herbicide application. So the, the story is that we are actually oftentimes killing some trees to favor others. The end result though is that we've got a more vigorous forest that's meeting uh, the composition and growth goals that we have to achieve the management objectives we've got. And whether that's for wildlife habitat, aesthetics, recreation, biological diversity, or timber production, we can select those trees based on those objectives to benefit. And it's not always just a timber tree. So I've got a, a white oak here that probably is dumping a good crop of acorns every fall. And it's also a, a hotel for critters here with these cavities. If you've got a strong wildlife habitat objective, that's a crop tree. That's a tree you want to manage for. So think about your objectives and that'll inform what species and types and characteristics of trees you're looking for to maintain on your property and make sure they retain that good growth and have a good long life. Uh, Lenny, one more question that came in. Yes. I've, heard that, I've heard that Tordon travels through the soil. Is Garlon safer to use? We yes. actually use uh, glyphosate, but may need to use something stronger. I am concerned that Tordon may kill stuff we want to keep. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about Tordon and some of the uh, the risks associated with it. It's a very effective herbicide, but it can travel in soil and tulip tree in particular is very sensitive to Tordon. Uh, so there are some cautions and many folks have moved more toward Garlon uh, in our forest 10% uh, uh, improvement applications because it doesn't tend to have the, uh, the level of mobility in the soil uh, or flashback to species that we don't want to have impacted, but it still does a good job of controlling. So great question, and we'll actually, we're going to talk in a little bit in depth before we're done about the, the herbicide choices you've got. So great question. So uh, one of the things we're looking at is, uh, is crop tree management. And so once again, we're thinking about this idea of favoring the trees that we want to see grow based on our objectives by identifying those and making sure they have growing space. And so it's called crop tree release. And here we're looking at the crown, the canopy of that tree, the growth engine where the leaf area is and thinking about what is competing with that. And if we've got a lot of trees impinging on that, and one of the things I look for is what I call flattened, uh, flattened sides or flattened edges. And so these canopies oftentimes wanna be pretty round. But what we'll see a lot of times is a flat edge where one tree is really strongly competing with it on one side. And essentially it can't extend that crown canopy out as much as it would like. Uh, that's a situation where we can thin that tree or kill that tree that's competing and provide additional growing space. And often what we're looking to do is actually produce a what we call a three to four sided release 
of that tree that we want to favor the growth of through time by thinning trees that are crowding its canopy on at least three of those four quadrants. Uh, and so in this case, this tree has only got one quadrant, number two, where it's got a significant competitor right now. But if we wanted to maintain its good growth through time, we would control that tree uh, that's competing with quadrant number two, and that would give that tree perhaps 10 more years of relatively unimpeded growth. If these other trees were much closer, we would actually control three to four of those sides to make sure that tree is the winner over time uh, for the resources on that site. And that's kind of an easy and, and uh, uh, unique way of thinking about what trees are providing you the maximum benefits based on your objectives and making sure those trees are getting the growth resources they need to stay alive and continue to provide those benefits and services you're looking for. So as promised, we're going to talk a little bit about herbicides. Uh, probably one of the most available herbicides to many landowners is the, are the glyphosate-based herbicides. There's lots and lots of different trade names. What you're looking for, though, is a herbicide with the active ingredient glyphosate, and it's typically at 41% active ingredient, some formulations higher than that. Uh, it's a, a good wide ranging application of different uses we can use for glyphosate. So foliar applications. Uh, this is great for invasive species control on many different species. Uh, and we'll typically have a two to 4% of the concentrate in the balance water. But if you've got hard water that can actually deactivate some of the benefits of glyphosate. And so we encourage you to either use soft water, collect rainwater, uh, use water from the water softened uh, uh, system, or you can treat hard water with ammonium sulfate. And you can get that at the ag stores, same places that sell the, uh, the glyphosate. It's typically a granular formulation that you would dissolve in your water before you would add your glyphosate herbicide. And it helps uh, condition that water and make it much more suitable for the application of glyphosate. And I'm usually putting about a cup in three gallons of water for my backpack applications. Uh, so this is an excellent technique to help your glyphosate work much better. If you're using a lot higher level spray, the application, or pardon me, the concentration is about 17 pounds per 100 gallons of water. So you can kind of work that out based on how much spray you're mixing. Uh, depending on the formulation of glyphosate you get, you may want to add some surfactants. This helps break the water tension. And also, uh, in many cases, for plants with waxy uh, leaf coats, uh, uh, an oil or a penetrant like methylated seed oil. And it's also a good idea to put dyes in any of your herbicide mixes. Number one, you can see where you've sprayed. And number two, you can tell if you've contaminated uh, clothing or equipment with that herbicide spray. And so it's a good check for safety as well. So foliar applications, about two to 4%, very effective. It need to be done during the growing season when plants are actively growing on growing vegetation. And I typically am spraying invasive species uh, late summer into fall. Spring, I think it's a little harder to control because that leaf flush is still pretty active. Also a great material for cut stump applications. Uh, if it's on a freshly cut stump, because this is a water-based herbicide and we can use the concentrate right out of the jug or diluted with 25 to 50% water, that's normally what I'm doing. And so I would take the concentrate and cut it with up to 50% water and then spray that on cut stumps or in girdles or frills. And I found it to be pretty effective, particularly during the growing season. Once again, be careful about when the sap is uh, flowing, it, it's gonna wash that herbicide right out of a girdle or frill or a cut stump. And so it's not gonna be effective if the sap is really flowing out of those stems. We've mentioned triclopyr formulations of herbicide. This is becoming more and more common uh, for applications in forestry, as mentioned earlier, uh, replacing Tordon in many cases. Uh, a couple of trade names, Garlon 3A, or four or triclopyr 3A or four. There are several other formulations out there. Uh, Vastlan is a uh, uh, one of the amines, Pathfinder 2. Uh, so it comes in two different formulations. Uh, the Garlon or triclopyr 3A and Vastlan are the amine formulations, water-based. And we use these for girdling, frilling, and cut stump treatments. And uh, in water mixtures, they can also be used for foliar applications. 
And for most of the girdle and cut stump and frilling, uh, is it either is used undiluted right out of the jug or mixed with up to 50% um, uh, water, a one-to-one -one water herbicide mix. Uh, and one of the advantages of this material is it doesn't seem to be as soil mobile or have the flashback potential that Tordon does. The uh, Garlon or Triclopyr 4 is the ester-based formulation. So this is for oil mixing, uh, and in some cases oil water mixes, but mostly we're using it for basal bark treatment or cut stump treatments in an oil formulation. Uh, it is not labeled in most cases for girdle and frill applications, and so that's an important consideration. Uh, you're always going to want to refer to that label and make sure you're using it in the way that the label indicates, and that is the, the law behind that. So for our basal bark and cut stump applications, we're using 15 to 20 percent of the herbicide in the balance oil, and that oil, as we mentioned, can be a commercially available basal oil. Uh, but also oftentimes on the label, it allows the use of kerosene or diesel oil, or in some cases, fuel oil. Now, as I mentioned, this can volatilize at high temperatures, so you need to be watching your weather when you're doing this application. This particular mixture has the advantage of being used for basal bark applications, so no cutting needed, or we can come back and treat stumps that have been cut maybe several hours or even several days ago, and the oil is going to penetrate that herbicide into that cut stump. So we don't have to worry about the timeline that we have for application that we, we experience when we're using water-based herbicides. So very useful group of herbicides here. Uh, oftentimes you're not going to find these on the shelves of some of the local ag stores. They may need to be ordered online or through your co-op or ag store, but uh, the readily available uh, typically through mail order or uh, outlets. So the last one I'm going to talk about here is the uh, uh, one that's been used for many, many years in forestry, partly because it was very effective. Uh, Tordon RTU or Pathway are two of the trade names, but it's a mixture of picloram and 2,4-D, typically in a ready-to-use formula, oftentimes with some uh, dye in the mix, uh, typically a blue dye. These are uh, outstanding materials for cut stump and girdling applications, but it is important to note that they can move in soil and are able to do so quite readily. And we're really shying away from these in invasive species control because oftentimes we have many hundreds of stems to treat per acre. And with that much material going on, we can get some pretty significant non-target impacts on trees. And particularly, I don't recommend using it anywhere near tulip tree. Uh, uh, jokingly say that if tulip tree sees the label of Tordon, it curls its leaves. Uh, it's very susceptible to this material uh, through soil spread. And you may think you're far enough away and be safe, but uh, oftentimes you're not. I've experienced that myself. 30 or 40 feet away, you can curl the leaves of that tree, killing another tree near it. So uh, definitely not one to use near tulip tree. But if you've got a limited number of uh, stems to control per acre or you've got some tough species to deal with, this still has its place. I would say that the quart applicator bottles you can get at some of the uh, farm stores, uh, they apply too much material. And so you're typically going to put on two times or more the amount of material you really need to get good control. So I recommend transferring that uh, material in the quart applicator to a squirt bottle or a squeeze bottle, and you're going to get uh, just as good a control and apply probably half the amount of herbicide uh, to get that good control. The other point, uh, important point I want to make is that uh, there are a variety of assistance means available for you. And so one of them is the U.S. Department of Agriculture has cost assistance programs that actually can help you pay for some of these management practices on your property, including uh, timber stand improvement, invasive species control, uh, pruning and plantations or native forest areas, uh, and uh, planting, and also erosion control and lots of other conservation practices. And practically every county in Indiana has a USDA service center. Uh, right now they're they're not taking on-site visits, but they are taking phone calls. And so if you're thinking about some of these practices on your property, a good uh, starting point oftentimes is to talk to these folks about the potential to get cost sharing or cost assistance on those practices. And uh, you can also oftentimes get hooked up with these folks through your soil and water conservation district office in your county. 
And then where do I go to actually get some on the ground assistance? And so one of the things I recommend landowners do is but really before you decide to actually put a saw to a tree, it's a good idea to have a forester out, uh, talk with them about your objectives, have them work with you some about what are the trees that I want to manage for and against on my property to meet those. A good starting point if you have 10 acres or more in forest or area that could be forest uh, is the Indiana Division of Forestry District Foresters. And these folks will offer management advice, uh, management plan development, and can direct you to additional resources for management on your property. They're typically not doing national management practices, but they can certainly get you started on the road with a lot of great advice and direction. If you want to hire out some work or also get some great advice uh, on your property, there are uh, uh, many private foresters that are available for hire uh, to help you with management on your property. And you can actually contact these foresters through this website, findindianaforester.org. It's got a great little search tool. You put in your county and it'll send a list through of the uh, private consulting and industrial foresters that are available uh, that may be able to help you with management on your property, including things like timber sales, timber stand improvement, invasive species control, and tree plantings. And then finally, lots and lots of information, both in terms of publications, videos, uh, recorded webinars, and we're getting more and more live and uh, recorded content in terms of internet resources available on our Purdue Forestry and Natural Resources Extension site. So I'd encourage you to look there for additional information. And then when it comes to invasive species, we've also got a good uh, uh, framework uh, for information here in Indiana. Uh, a really nice clearinghouse site is the Indiana Invasive Species Council site. They'll direct you to a lot of these other resources. Uh, Purdue Extension also has a great reporting and information site on invasive species. And a really wonderful tool that I've used extensively for invasive species control recommendations is the Midwest Invasive Plant Network Control Database. Uh, this goes through many different invasive species with a nice listing of different control techniques and how effective they found them to be. So a great tool there. And then once again, the cost sharing programs through USDA can really help you a lot in terms of defraying the cost, whether you hire this work done or do it yourself. And so with that, um, I've kind of taken a 30,000 foot view of this, uh, lots of topics to cover, uh, but we definitely want to leave some time for your questions and I'm happy to allow as much time as it takes to do that. Uh, so let me actually stop sharing here. Yeah, Lenny, I, I got a couple of these privately, but one of them was uh, back on the herbicides, the best, best tactic to kill black locust. Oh, yes. Uh, black locust actually is pretty susceptible to glyphosate. Uh, both black and, and uh, honey seem to be. Uh, so if you've got larger trees, you could girdle or cut stump and apply uh, either glyphosate herbicide to those cuts or the triclopyr uh, compounds those cuts. Or if you don't have a lot else in the area, go ahead and use Tordon. Uh, all those would be pretty effective on black locust, but you will need to use herbicide. Uh, because of the root sprouting and stump spreading that black locust is famous for. And you're probably not going to get finished with one application. Uh, they have extensive root systems and can put up sprouts, and so you may have to do a follow-up to take care of some of those sprouts. All right, another one, a uh, little more on the urban forestry side, but uh, somebody said they have a half-acre lot in town. It's kind of long here, so bear with me. Uh, totally run, overrun with English ivy, Asian bush, Honeysuckle and daylilies, which we're slowly slowly getting removed, but I have but have tall maples, a walnut, hackberry, and black locust. We'd like some tree diversity to promote wildlife habitat. No utilities going through area. Some sun on the south, but total shade on the north side of the lot. Suggestions on infill. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, great. So job number one is the one you're in right now, and that's control all those invasives. Uh, it'll be much harder to deal with them if you allow additional sunlight in. So get those taken care of, and then everything else is going to go a lot easier. And I, I hate to t say this, it's going to be the hard job, but it's the one you need to tackle first. Once you've got those tackled, 
Uh, look first to your sunny area. You can plant almost anything you want in those areas. And what I recommend you do is look at a variety of resources, including some of our Purdue Extension, about wildlife friendly uh, plants, uh, shrubs and trees of a variety of different types. The other thing I'm going to encourage you to think about is girdling. Uh, if you if you can safely leave them standing and let them decay, girdle the black locust. Black locust is kind of questionable whether it's really native to most of Indiana. It's a very competitive tree, and it provides some pollinator benefits with its white blooms, but otherwise maybe not as nice as some of our other tree species. And by girdling those, you're going to provide some standing deadwood, which is great for woodpeckers, and then also provide a little additional sunlight into the understory of your forest, which may allow you to establish some things like some of the native viburnums, like maple leaf viburnum or black haw, or some uh, shade tolerant shrubs or small trees like pawpaw or spice bush. Uh, and the nice thing about pawpaw and spice bush is they're both really deer resistant, but produce some fruit that would be utilized by wildlife like birds um, and pawpaw. It's candy for everything. Uh, so those would be uh, my recommendations on the management of that. Uh, also, Indiana DNR, I believe, has a pretty good uh, backyard wildlife um, uh, information set that can give you some guidance on developing backyard wildlife habitats. Another question, uh, we planted mixed hardwoods three years ago. We want to run a raised road near it how far off the tree should we put the road oh okay well i'm going to hedge and say as far as possible <laughs> <laughs> phil is really hard on root systems particularly of upland trees and so you think about bottomland trees will actually take it better so things like um, uh, green ash, well, we wouldn't do green ash anymore because of emerald ash borer, but silver maple, stuff that is used to being in a floodplain and getting deposition of soil on it will tolerate this better than our upland trees will. But if you get mostly upland trees, you're going to want to stay 30 or 40 feet away if you can, because those root systems extend quite a long way away from the tree. I, I don't know if that's going to be possible in your situation, but just recognize that fill over the top of an existing root system uh, can do a lot of damage. Now, if the trees are small, You've got more flexibility. You could go a little closer, you know, maybe 10, 15 feet. And what's going to happen is those roots are going to kind of work up into that area. And if they can't get up through it, they're going to work around it. And they're going to go in other directions. But with larger existing trees, it can be really damaging. Okay, Lenny, I think we've taken care of most of the questions. Uh, I don't believe I introduced myself at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, my name is John Wood Mancy, and uh, Lenny, if you want to pass the host to me there. Um, we appreciate everybody coming, and um, I want to share something here. Let's see here. Okay, can you all see that? Is there a PowerPoint slide there? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is our evaluation for tonight. And uh, you can either use your smartphone to use that QR code or either one of those websites will take you to our evaluation. We'd appreciate your feedback. Um, also, I'd like to thank Lenny for uh, his time and his presentation tonight. Got a lot of good compliments on the chat and in the Q&A, Lenny, on your presentation. So we appreciate your efforts there. My pleasure. Okay. Also like to uh, remind everybody and maybe a little commercial for two weeks from tonight. We are going to be uh, back with Lenny on considerations for selling timber. We're did, uh, devoting the whole night to that. So um, we'll be uh, uh, looking toward that. So um, thank you all for um, participating tonight. I'd like to say that uh, another thing, I'm going to take this away so we can, I can uh, get back to my presentation here. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, the recording. We are recording this. And uh, so check back on the Purdue Extension Whitley County site. We may have that on a couple of other sites, but as long as this recording records as it should, 
we should have a, a video that you can review later on. Um, so with that, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Lenny, again, and thank you all for attending. And we'll call this an evening. So thank you. Thank you.